right, it's Barry, and today on Grow It, I've got everything that you need to know about direct sowing seeds. First, we'll have a look at what actually happens when seeds germinate. We'll look at the pros and cons of direct sowing to see if it's the right way to sow for you. And then we'll have a quick rundown on marigolds and companion planting before I do a direct sowing demo with the marigold seeds. And then finally, I'll go over what you need to do to care for your newly germinated seeds over the coming weeks. So let's get on with it. When you think about it, seeds are the most incredible things. They hold within them the potential for new life that could come in the shape of one giant seed like the stone in an avocado, or they could be so small that thousands of them together can just look like dust or grains of sand. When a seed germinates, it goes through a number of biological processes that begin its journey towards becoming a full-grown plant and eventually producing seeds of its own. Understanding how seeds germinate, what seeds need to germinate, and what they do after they germinate is essential for any gardener who might be looking to grow their own plants. And hopefully by the end of this video, you'll have everything that you need to know to start growing your seeds straight away. I'm not gonna go too far into all the complicated science of how all of this works as much as I'd like to bore you with all of that but hopefully I'll be able to give you all of the interesting bits without being too boring. The process of seed germination begins with the seed absorbing water and the botanical term for this process is called imbibition and this hydration of the seed triggers a number of enzymes that are inside the seed to activate which in turn causes the seed to break open and that allows the embryonic plant that's inside to start growing. As the plant begins to grow it sends out a root which begins to absorb nutrients and water from the soil. The next step in the process is the emergence of the shoot which will eventually grow into the stem and leaves of the plant. As the shoot grows upwards towards the light it continues to develop more and more true leaves which are the ones that you'll recognize that actually look like the leaves rather than the little tiny thin ones that you get once the seed first germinates and they help the plant to perform photosynthesis and produce its own energy. A long time ago I made a bit of a guide on how photosynthesis works and it might have maybe been the second or third video that I make but if that's something that interests you do check out that video to find out how plants use light to live and definitely do check out the other like 100 videos that I've made since then as well. Temperature and moisture are two of the most important factors that can affect seed germination. Seeds require a specific range of temperatures to germinate with some plants preferring warmer temperatures and others preferring lower temperatures. So it is really important to find out the germination requirements for each type of seed that you want to plant, especially if you're direct sowing, but you can usually meet the specific temperature needs of the seeds by sowing them at the correct time of year. In fact, most seed packets will just have the time of year highlighted for when to sow them rather than listing the actual temperatures, but some will usually have both as well. Things get slightly more complicated in large places like the USA where you have climate zones and they can affect when seeds go in quite considerably but we don't really use those in the UK as pretty much everybody is in the same zone and which actually on that subject we just had a, a late stint of cold weather here in the UK and if you live here you'll definitely know about that already but for those of you elsewhere in the world I think it gave us like a 21 degrees Celsius difference in temperature at the same time between the north of Scotland and the south of England, which is fairly unusual here. It's normally maybe six degrees or something, but that's a bit closer to what it's like when there's multiple climate zones going on. So yeah, don't envy places that have got to put up with that when it comes to picking when you're going to be sowing things, because it, yeah, I've not got that, quite got my head around it yet, but I will have a look into it and see if I can work that out for maybe for in a video in the future. Anyway, seeds also need to be kept hydrated during the germination process so that they have enough water to activate those enzymes in the inside that I mentioned earlier. This is best achieved by making sure that they're kept damp with careful watering and high humidity, which is the purpose of using like bags, lids and propagators to make sure that the air stays nice and humid inside so that they don't dry out. Light's another really important factor that can impact seed germination and some seeds need light to germinate while others need to be covered by soil or other material to be completely in the dark or even just a bit to block out the light but yeah everything is different so in general small seeds should be planted shallowly where larger seeds should be planted deeper but then again the light requirements and planting depth should be noted in the same place as the sowing time and temperatures for whichever species that is that you're growing so again check those out 
and I'm sure you'll be fine. The last thing to consider when sowing your seeds is to choose the right type of soil or other growing medium for your seeds. A good quality soil will have the right balance of nutrients, water retention and drainage to promote healthy seedling growth. Personally, I prefer to use different starting mediums depending on the time of the year and what it is that I'm growing. So for example, in the late spring and summer, I'll sow directly into the soil when it's nice and warm or I'll use compost if I'm growing in trays. But when I'm starting seeds off in the winter and early spring when it's a lot colder, like for my tomatoes, I like to get them started in January. I'll sow them into Rockwell grow plugs and just use water just because I can fit more plants into a smaller space and keep them warm a bit easier without using loads of heaters and things. Understanding the basics of how seeds germinate is crucial for any gardener looking to start their own plants and it can make the difference between success and failure and by providing the right conditions for your seeds to germinate you can help ensure that they grow into healthy and thriving plants that can last right through the growing season and beyond. Direct sowing is a gardening method that unsurprisingly involves planting seeds directly into the ground rather than starting them indoors and then transplanting them into the ground later. While direct sowing can be convenient and an easy way to start your plants growing, there are also some potential drawbacks to consider. One of the biggest advantages of direct sowing is that it is a really low cost method for gardening. Instead of buying expensive pre-grown seedlings and plants or buying propagators and compost for starting seeds indoors, you can just simply sow your seeds directly into the ground and this can be especially beneficial if you're looking to plant a large garden or for growing food crops on an allotment as it can save you a decent chunk of money and time. And that is the next advantage because direct sowing can also save so much time. Once you've preferred all your soil, all you need to do is plant the seeds and wait for them to germinate. And this can be a lot more time efficient than starting seeds indoors, which requires all that additional effort uh, going into preparing seed trays, maintaining the proper artificial growing conditions, and then the time needed to transport them around and transplant them into the final growing position. Another advantage of direct sowing is that it can be a more natural way of gardening if that is something that you're particularly interested in. When you plant your seeds directly into the ground, you're allowing them to grow in the conditions that they would just naturally encounter and grow in. Although a lot of commercial varieties aren't anything like the naturally occurring ancestors, so it's just a case of whether you like them to just go in the ground and grow in that sense of being natural rather than being moved around and stuff but yeah it, it, if that's something that you're interested in then it is a bit of a better way to do it and it can result in stronger and more resilient plants as well because they're more adapted as they grow to the local environment and they won't experience all the shock that can come from being transplanted because uh, that can interrupt growth and sometimes plants won't even survive being relocated so it, it's yeah, it's, it's a good way to grow if you can do it. It's not all good though, there are some potential drawbacks that come with direct sowing as well and I'll go into those now. One of the biggest risks is that the seeds might not even germinate or they could be eaten by pests or animals before they even have a chance to grow. In my experience it's important to protect your seeds from animals by using like netting or other protective measures like lids or cloches just to keep the seeds safe while also adding the extra benefits of providing a bit of extra warmth and humidity to help with germination. Another potential disadvantage of direct sowing is that it can result in uneven or crowded plant growth. When you plant seeds directly into the ground, it can be difficult to space them out properly or ensure that they're planted at the correct depth. And this can result in overcrowding, which can make it difficult for plants to grow and thrive. For that reason, it is important to thin out your seedlings once they germinate, leaving the strongest ones at the correct spacing for whatever it is that you're growing. So altogether, direct sowing can be a low cost, time saving and natural way of gardening, but it also comes with some potential risks such as uneven or crowded plant growth and the possibility of seeds not germinating at all. So it is worth considering both the pros and cons of direct sowing so that you can determine if it is the right method of your, for your gardening needs. And I like to do a bit of a mixture. So for example, I'll direct sow my sweet peas in spring but I'll also grow them indoors over a winter so I like to direct sow root vegetables like beetroot, radishes and carrots because I find that they just really don't care for being transplanted and moved around but I like to grow my pumpkins and corn seeds in pots before I plant them out because they usually do quite well. I mostly direct sow flower seeds though uh, from spring onwards and I'm going to show you one of those right now.
Marigold flowers are one of the most popular annual flowers because they're easy to grow and they come in a variety of colours and shapes, including bright oranges, yellows and reds. Plus, they're not only a beautiful addition to your garden, they also have practical uses as a companion flower to grow with your tomato plants, which I'll just get into shortly. Marigolds have the botanical name to GTs and the part of the daisy family Asteraceae. They're native to Mexico and Central America and the Aztecs used marigolds in the religious ceremony and for medical purposes and they also believed that the scent of marigolds could ward off evil spirits. When the Spanish arrived in the Americas they brought marigolds along with tomatoes back with them to Europe where they quickly became very popular as ornamental plants and over time many different varieties of marigolds have been cultivated each with their own unique characteristics. For example we've got French marigolds which are smaller and bushier than African marigolds, which are larger and grow more upright. In addition to the use as ornamental plants, marigolds have been used for a variety of other purposes throughout history. Uh, they've been used as natural dye, as well as traditional medicine to treat various ailments. You know, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure that every plant has been used as a traditional medicine for something at some point. Today, marigolds are still popular ornamental plants and are widely grown in gardens around the world. I'm not sure whether they're still used as a medicine, so maybe if you know of marigolds being used as a traditional remedy wherever you are in the world, give me a shout in the comments and let me know where you are and what they've been used for. In terms of when to sow marigold seeds, they can be sown directly into the ground in spring once the soil has warmed up a bit. The ideal temperature for germination is around 21 degrees Celsius or 70 degrees Fahrenheit and marigold seeds usually take around 7 to 14 days to germinate depending on the variety and the growing conditions. I'm direct sowing my marigolds today in the big greenhouse and it's almost time for my tomato plant to go in there so this year I've decided to sow a load of marigolds into the beds ready to fill them out. As I mentioned earlier, marigolds are the perfect companion plant for tomato plants as they're known for their ability to repel pests, which is why I want to load in my greenhouse this year because I had murder with them last year with pests and white flies and stuff. So this year I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that they don't come in. The roots of marigold plants produce a chemical called alpha terthianyl and that repels nematodes, which are microscopic worms that can seriously damage tomato plant roots. Additionally, marigolds will attract beneficial insects such as ladybirds, which will hunt down common tomato plant pests like green flies, aphids and white flies. So they're really good to have in the greenhouse. When you're planting your marigolds as a companion to your tomato plants, it is really important to choose the right variety of marigold. French marigolds are the most effective at repelling nematodes, while African marigolds are bigger and more colourful, making them a bit more ornamental and more likely to attract in those other ones, the beneficial ones that you want in there. So I've got absolutely loads and loads of open packs of marigold seeds left over from last year that need using up this year. So I'll probably just chuck all of them in a big mix, mix them all up together, and that should cover all of those potential benefits that are on offer. So let's get those seeds and get in the greenhouse and get them into the ground. So here we go. I've got all of these different marigold seeds that I've got like open packs. I think there's a couple of full packs as well. I think I got these when they was reduced in, uh, in Wilco. So I've got a couple of extra packs and they're only 25, well they were, I don't know how much they cost now, but they were only 25p at the time, so I think they're from Lidl. I have no idea what these are, or how old they are. Oh, well, I don't know what they are, but I don't know where they're from. And then I've uh, got some Calendula seeds as well. Um, these are known as pop marigolds, or English marigolds, and a couple of other names, and they're not actually marigolds. They're the same family from, same from Asteraceae family, but they're not actually not actually marigolds, so I'll be putting them in anyway. They do have some of similar pest preventing properties, so might as well start with them. I need to get rid of them this year anyway, because I'll get some fresh ones for next year. Um, got this little tub, just gonna tip everything into there, to be honest, and uh, give them a mix up, and then get them all into that bed in the uh, in the greenhouse where the tomatoes are going. So, see if we can get all, get all of these out. I mean, you can see from the seeds anyway, um, they are like little weird little crispy worm type looking seeds but marigold seeds are like sort of like what you get on a dandelion without the um you'll see on like same as dandelions they've got the little fluffy bit that lets them float on the wind so they're sort of like those like little 
long ones. Anyway, they're all going in there. And what's these ones? These are French Petite Mixed. Probably saw, but the ones I've just poured in there were African ones, so they're gonna have those bigger flowers. These are gonna be a lot smaller. Are these? Orange Flame. Not really very specific, so get them in there. These are the ones that always manage to escape the packs as well, for whatever reason. They always seem to be the ones that are lurking around in the bottom of my seed packs and my seed boxes, and bags and things. I'll always find these lurking about at the bottom. I don't know how they manage to escape, but they always manage to. Can't even get in this now. Yeah, it's quite a lot here, so <laughs> going to be doing some thinning out by the looks of things. And as I was mentioning earlier as well, you can see here with our uh, seeds in the UK, you've got like a month thing for the whole year. And it'll show you when you can sow indoors, plant out, sow outdoors, and when they're due to flower. Um, yeah, it's got all your information here. And this will be obviously different depending on where you are in the world and where you're buying your seeds. But like I said, they didn't mention the actual germination temperatures, but... You can get a general guide from this and i'm going to be planting in the greenhouse anyway so they are going indoors and it is march so perfect timing um i'll use up these ones as well just get rid of them i've got so many packs of seeds i just <laughs> want to plant as many as i can this year and make a bit more room there we go so i've got a nice big yeah i've got like <laughs> couple of hundred maybe thousand seeds there ready to go in so give them a bit of a mix up in there and I'm just gonna I'm just gonna really heavily sow those into these beds in the greenhouse so let's get in there now and have a look at those so here we are in the greenhouse and this is my big tomato bed um it's a bit dry there's obviously nothing in it at the moment so we're just looking compost soil um it's got some um like slow release fertilizer that's in there already. Oh, that's just burst because it's all wet. Oh, I, was, I hope it was one of those and not like some kind of egg. Anyway, um, so what I'm gonna do is just put a long row um, in here of uh, the marigolds and then just let them let them grow and do as they please. I'll probably, when they, when they grow and they're a bit more crowded in here, I'll probably um, maybe move some and just dot them about everywhere around the tomato plants because by the time these grow the tomato plants are going to be in and they're going to all be growing um sort of well along on the way so i'll uh yeah possibly move them around and see i'll see how that goes anyway i don't <laughs> just do it as it comes anyway best thing i can say for when you're doing stuff like this for doing your rolls and your drills is to just use a garden cane i'm gonna leave um i'm gonna leave a bit of a gap here because i'm gonna put um, a bit of an irrigation system in uh, in the next couple of weeks as well that I can um, attach the hose pipe and water everything here a bit more rapidly uh, so uh, yeah so there's two ways you can do it really you can pre-dig your um, sort of like a trench well not really dig but use your trowel or whatever to sort of put a drill in all the way along that you can use for dropping your seeds into that's the way I generally do it or you can use the actual stick or if you're using a thicker stick um to sort of press down and then when you lift that up if your soil's a bit damper than this is it's too dry to do that sort of thing but if you're using damper soil press your stick down and that'll leave an impression that you can drop your seeds into but as i say i'll use this cane just to make sure i'll go in a straight line all the way along and then i'll put those seeds into the um another thing that i'll do I'll, when i'm planting outside this has already got loads of compost mixed in from the other day when uh when i dug it all in but if i was putting these into a bed outside i'd use the normal soil put my seeds in and then i put i sort of fill in the trench with compost uh for one it obviously breaks down it gives that nutrition to your flowers and your plants as they start to germinate but also it acts as a bit of a marker because the compost sort of a lighter brown um than than the actual soil itself which will have a bit more of a gray color to it or well depending on where you look it does here anyway because it's absolutely awful soil i mean that's 
that's my soil here. Um, so that's why I've got to put so much compost into it. But um, yeah, so I'll use compost to mark out the, the line where all the seeds are and then you can sort of see where it is and you know when they start germinating that it's the ones that you've planted and it's not some weeds or something else that's growing in there. So we've got a nice line there, which is sort of uh, suitable for marigold seeds. And like I say, I've mixed all of these up and I'm just going to put absolutely tons in here because I want to make sure that they do grow. Especially with um, how old some of them are as well. I, I want to make sure that at least some germinate because some of them might be a bit past it now. So yeah, there's absolutely loads of seeds in there. Um, and all I do now is cover those over with the soil. And as I say, what I do outside, I just use compost on its own just to give you a slightly different coloured line as you grow along. And you can also just leave your canes in. I've done that before. Leave your cane there. And that's what I'm going to do, just because I don't have that difference in uh, that difference in colour to indicate where those seeds are. I'm just going to leave that cane in so that when I do come to plant my tomatoes uh, later this week or next week, I'm going to know where this line is so I don't dig them back up again and, and spoil all that uh, effort. Um, so that's it yeah really simple process as far as these ones go um if it was bigger seeds maybe if you was planting onion sets you'd want to go a bit deeper but with these marigolds they're going to be perfectly happy as they are and you can also uh, maybe with wildflowers i've done that before um give them a bit of a mix with some sand um, like some horticultural sand and that'll um act as a bit of an indicator so when you you can just scatter those straight on top of your soil and the sandal acts as a bit of an indicator to see where your seeds have gone so that you're not going over the same place over and over again. So that's another thing you could possibly do in this situation. Use a bit of a line of some horticultural sand just across the top so that you know where that row of seeds is. So all I've got to do now is do that for the rest of this, uh, this bed in here and that's done. After direct sowing your seeds, it's important to care for the seedlings properly once they've germinated to make sure that they continue to grow into healthy plants. Direct sowing is a great, quick and convenient way to start your plants off, but it also requires a little bit of additional care and attention to make sure that your seedlings have the best chance of survival. One of the most important things to do is provide enough water and nutrients. Seedlings need a consistent amount of watering, especially during hot and dry weather. So when you're starting your plants growing, it's best to choose a location with good drainage so that all that water that you're giving to them doesn't pool around your seedlings and cause them to rot or drown. Additionally, you can optionally try adding a layer of mulch around your seedlings, which can help conserve that moisture and keep the soil cool. Shredded newspaper is pretty handy for doing that, so it's not as heavy as bark mulch and it'll keep that moisture in. Fertilising your seedlings with a quarter or half strength fertiliser can also help encourage growth but do be careful not to over fertilise them as it can cause damage to your plants when they're really young and small. They are quite sensitive to fertilisers so if you're just in doubt or you're not sure just go with a quarter strength dilution until the plants are a bit bigger and they'll be finding nutrients in the soil anyway so don't worry about it. Protecting your seedlings from pests and diseases is a big job, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, insects and other pests that can quickly destroy newly sprouted seedlings. So it is really important to be vigilant, keep an eye out for them, because in my experience, row covers such as fleece and netting, they can be a really good way to protect your seedlings from pests while still allowing them to receive sunlight and moisture. Fleece covers can also help protect seedlings from extreme temperatures and strong winds. Um, it is important to remove those covers once your seedlings have established themselves though and they're growing strong just to make sure that they're, again, they're not overcrowded or reaching the top or yeah, just use them on something else once your seedlings are established. Earlier on in the year I tend to have the most problems with slugs on seedlings or another problem I've got is birds. If I gas peas outside they strip all of the leaves off them and just leave the stems because they're obviously really, uh, really sweet and tasty, so the birds love pinching all of them. And if I've got lettuces or anything leafy, the slugs tend to have a way with them. So do whatever you can, look at the different ways and other videos for finding out how you can get those pests away from your plants. But again, it's all the case of being vigilant and doing everything that you can to keep them out. 
The next stage occurring for your seedlings after they germinate from direct sowing is to thin them out. As seedlings grow and mature, they'll compete for all those resources in the soil, such as nutrients and water. And if there's too many seedlings growing in the same space, they just won't have enough resources to grow properly and healthy. So thinning out your seedlings will allow the remaining plants that are there to have more space and other those resources to grow properly. It's a good idea to use some really sharp scissors or pruners like the little horticultural snips to avoid damaging the seedlings that you've got there. You can be a bit more precise cutting those other ones that you don't want to waste. So I'll leave a link for those in the description. They're uh, quite cheap and they're really handy to have for when you're doing that with your seedlings. As your seedlings continue to grow, it is important to keep an eye on the development. Some plants might need additional support, such as staking or trellising. And providing support for your seedlings as they get bigger will help to keep them upright and allow them to reach the full potential. Finally, you'll need to be patient with your seedlings. While it can be exciting to watch your seedlings grow, it can also be really frustrating when they don't grow as quickly as you'd like. And the thing to remember is that each plant has its own timeline and it'll grow at its own pace. Well, there we are. I hope that you've got all the information that you need to get started with direct sowing your seeds for this year. And I hope that you'll be growing some marigolds with your tomato plants to keep all of those pests away as well. Don't forget to like this video if it's helped or inspired you to give direct sowing a go. Or even if you're already direct sowing your seeds, liking this video will help YouTube suggest it to other people that are also interested in gardening. And that helps out my channel a lot and while you're here don't forget to check out all my other plant growing videos for loads of projects and ideas to get the most out of your growing space no matter how big or small it is and I'll see you next time